Hello, everybody, and welcome to Avid Reader Bookshop. I am um, admitting a whole bunch of people into our Zoom room. So um, welcome to all the people who are piling in. It may take a couple of minutes um, to get you all in here because this is our second largest event that we have ever run at Avid Reader Bookshop. Um, so I think that we had one rock star, someone zooming in from the UK who may have beat our number, but um, tonight we have the biggest online event that we have ever hosted, apart from international famous rock stars. I would say that Jackie Huggins is an internationally famous rock star in her own right. Um, so it, it will take us a couple of minutes to get everybody into um, the room. Uh, so, you know, make sure that you're comfy, make sure that you um, have your uh, a drink handy, a glass of water, a glass of wine, a glass of gin, whatever is your um, drink of choice. It has been a very, very hot day in Brisbane. So if you're zooming in from Brisbane, um, you may want an iced water at the moment because it has been a shocker. Well, um, we do have quite a few people in the room, but there are still people piling in. So we will give it another minute before um, we let people, we start our event today. Uh, and while I'm letting people in, I would like to um, let you all know that um, the book of the moment, Sister Girl, um, is available to purchase. And if you call Avid Reader during the event tonight, um, because even though this is a Zoom event, I am Zooming out from Avid Reader. If you call Avid Reader during the event tonight on, get your pens ready, 07-3846-3422, 07-3846-3422. So call us on that number during the event tonight. And um, if you pay for a copy of your book, we will get that personally dedicated to you and we can also um, post that out if you pay for postage. So um, we can organise a signed copy for you wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, so that's very exciting. And um, although we do have quite a few people piling in, um, we'll just go for another minute before we start the event because there's, there still seems to be a lot of people piling in to the Zoom room. So um, just bear with us while we let everyone in. Um, we will send out that phone number to purchase your copy of the book via the chat function um, after the event has started. So keep an eye out on the chat function for um, that phone number or a link to the book if you want to purchase online. But if you do want it personally signed, we do need you to call us and um, pay for the book and then we can get that personally signed to you. Of course, there should be some extra signed copies after the event tonight without a personal or dedication. So if you different you can hop in and grab that. I do hear the phone going already and I won't be able to answer that until we start the event. So if that's you calling now, um, we're just going to have to wait until I start the event um, before I take calls. So wait till I'm gone and then I will be able to take that call. Great. I think um, we might just get started and just let people in as they come through. So I I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any other elders who are here tonight with us. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge that this is a Zoom event and so therefore we are Zooming out onto the lands of many different Aboriginal peoples right across this country. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, now it is with Great pleasure that I introduce a very dear friend of ours who will be hosting tonight. Dr. Anita Heiss is an award-winning author of non-fiction, historical fiction, commercial women's fiction, children's novels and blogs and plays. And she is um, an amazing um, multitasker who has an output to die for. Um, she is a proud member of the Wiradjuri Nation uh, and is a professor of communications at the University of Queensland. 
Her latest novel is Villa Yara Dangarang Dure, and it is fantastic. It was um, one of my favorite reads of last year, and um, I highly recommend it to anybody. Um, so if you are calling up about Sister Girl, you might want to call up about a copy of um, Villa to, um, to purchase, and Anita, I'm sure, would sign that for you as well. Anita's play Titters will be produced by Le Boite for this year's Brisbane Festival and tickets for that are on sale already and I know that's going to sell out. So if you do want to grab a copy, um, that will actually um, sell out pretty soon. So make sure that you get onto that soon. Um, so it's I'm now going to hand over to the wonderful Anita Heiss. Um, I think you also have a helicopter out there to listen to. So I'm, I'm going to hand over right now. So um, here is Anita Heiss. Andangul Chrissy. Marangiria, you and your young at a high spell, a dual Raju Gilang, a Rambiji Bull, Brangley Bull, me again, dear Bala Williams, in the Maladul, Balga Balga Galambo, Balaki Bumble, Balam Bumble Bull, Raju, here in Bumble, in the Maladul, me and Jim Bull, Maine. Good evening, everybody. My name's Anita. Heist, and I have Raju belonging from the Rambi and Brumble missions in the central New South Wales. My mob are the Williamses. Every day I have respect for my Wiradjuri elders, um, for those who've passed on my ancestors and Wiradjuri country. But tonight I pay my respects to the traditional owners of country here in the engine in Brisbane. And Jackie and I are very excited that you're joining us along with the helicopters overhead. Um, we'd love to know where you're zooming in from. So perhaps you could put in the chat box where, you're, where you are tonight, whose country you're on. Um, we are, it's been 24 years in the making to get here this evening for this celebration of this edition of Sister Girl. Now, as you can imagine, it was a great uh, feat to try and pull back Jackie's enormous CV mm. to a paragraph. But um, that's what we've tried to do. So this is what I'm going to tell you. But Dr. Jackie Huggins is a member of the Bidjara and Biri Gaba Juru peoples. She's in very popular demand as a speaker on Aboriginal issues. She's a well-known historian and author with articles published widely in Australia and internationally. Some of those pieces appear in this edition of Sister Girl. Her acclaimed biography of her mother, uh, Auntie Rita was published way back in 1994 and, and keeping it in the family this year in 2022, her biography of her father will be released through Magabala and that is titled Jack of Hearts QX11594. Welcome Jackie, it's, it's so wonderful to be here with you this evening to celebrate the new edition, although I still love dearly the original edition. Yes, thanks very much, um, Anita. And um, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of uh, the country of Brisbane that we're standing on, that we're sitting on here tonight, and to uh, thank everybody for, for joining in, especially um, Estelle, who has uh, joined in from Silicon Valley in the USA. Uh, Estelle is a dear friend, uh, a wonderful friend of the Aboriginal. Uh, and Torres Strait Islander literature. She knows all our writers and uh, recently um, she's been doing some work uh, with Anita, uh, Alexis Wright and others. Um, so uh, welcome Estelle and I'm, I'm glad you're here with us tonight and uh, that your two little boys are asleep and uh, they'll be very quiet there over in Silicon Valley. So um, so wonderful and uh, what a molly to you too Anita. You're such a, a dear friend uh, I knew you when you were a teenager, actually, back in the day. And, uh, you know, I hope we can speak about some of those early days of uh, writing. I think we know what happens on tour stays on book tour back in the day. Oh, Jackie yes. Huggins. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And we were chatting before we went live about how Zoom has made it possible for not just Estelle and people overseas, but all around even Brisbane tonight because of COVID, everything's online. And so it's extra special that we could probably have more people being able to join us than we would have if it was just in the yes. store. Now we are here, to, as you know, to celebrate the new edition of Sister Girl, Reflections on Titterism, Identity and Reconciliation. Now in this collection of essays, Jackie, you cover many themes, obviously from the original edition as well, uh, issues, moments in history, these are moments and issues that have impacted you personally, but also the nation at large. 
new right of the role of Aboriginal women as domestic servants in Australian history and then the pseudo role that our women have in the white feminist movement of the 1990s. Uh, you're open, very open about your personal relationships with your mother, the late Auntie Rita, and your beautiful son, John Henry. I'm going to try not to shame him tonight. Hi, John Henry. Now, whether you're writing about politics or you're writing about your personal life, what I love about reading your words is that they're always from your heart, they're with depth, they're with soul, and they're with passion. And sometimes there's a little bit of humour. Because um, don't forget, I think, you know, you and I agree that our capacity to laugh has, is what sustained us over, you know, centuries of, of adversity. So there are moments when readers, for those of you who haven't, haven't had a chance yet, uh, you will laugh, you will smile out loud. Um, and I think some of those experiences you'll find are when, Jackie, you write about life in the public service, when you learn to, where you learn to fight racism, where you learn to write reports and you learn to drive a Z car. So some of those moments give a few of the lighter moments in your story. Mm. I, when I read this latest edition last week, I thought to myself, I could see book clubs around Australia having some very useful, valuable much needed conversation. So if you're watching and you're in a book club, please make sure that in the next 12 months, uh, you include um, the new edition of Sisterville. That would be great. Now, this new edition builds on the original 16th edition. The first thing I wanted to do tonight, we've, got, we've, we've, we've already done a Zoom and talked through all this, but we decided no questions. We've got so much we want to talk about is I want to, I want to start the conversation with your greatest sister girl, the one known to you most, and that is your late um, mother, Auntie Rita. Now, there's an essay in your memoir titled Writing My Mother's Life, and in it you talk about um, how difficult it was to write your mum's story. So I thought it would be apt this evening for just to start the discussion with you telling the audience, for those who didn't have the privilege of meeting your mum, telling the audience a little bit about your mum. Okay, thank you. Well, um, oh, what can I say about um, Auntie Rita, um, my very dear mother who, uh, it's been 25 years since she's passed the leader. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the same old story, you, you, a day never goes by without you even thinking about her or, you know, talking to her and stuff. Um, and to have that um, uh, that wonderful woman in my life who taught me so much. Look, she uh, went through life uh, through adversity. Um, she, uh, she used to um, say, I don't know what I did to deserve the life I had. But, you know, amongst that, there were very joyous times. And, you know, she was very proud of... Um, um, of being uh, that great, strong Aboriginal woman. She was warm, she was engaging, energetic, um, enthralling, actually. And um, she was a bit like you, um, Anita, um, as well. I'll come to that in a minute. But um, she always knew uh, a person and she could actually see really inside the depth of that person. And um, she'd often say to me, um, you know, Jackie, oh, that's, she's your real friend or, um, you know, better be aware of this one. She could actually mm -hmm. see through that. And if she loved you, she loved you. If she didn't like you, she would let it be known and she'd give you the cold shoulder. So she had this amazing insight. Um, if anything, too trusting at times, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, she's a bit... Uh, trusting but then you know I learned so much from her and um, look I have to say uh, and I'll come back to you uh, if uh, if you ever met Auntie Rita uh, you'd never forget her she was just one of those people and I'm so very um, honoured to have been brought up um, she was a single mum lost my dad at two and uh, she was everything everything to us um, as, uh, as, uh, as children as, and as uh, grandchildren. So, yeah, that's my mum. So um, she used to say to me too, Anita, I want to see this book before I die. 
So that put the pressure on, you know. And that came out in 1994. I remember uh, there was an event up at the Woodford Bellamy Festival and over the summer then. How did she, how did Arnie Rita feel when her story was finally released? Oh, she felt so proud and so released and and so uh, relieved. Uh, that it had been out yeah. and in fact uh you know she we had 14 months of really wonderful launching and going to writers festivals and, and speaking about the book and uh she I, I think at that stage then she felt she could just let go a bit you know because she she wanted to um really um have her story out there but it's a story that she always said was um not atypical of other aboriginal women that they had a similar lifestyle, especially, you know, those of uh, us who were born here in Queensland under the Act and uh, sent out to domestic servants as a a young young woman. Um, And, you know, she she, um, met and married my dad and and we were all born in in North Queensland. What a mully to everybody as well in my dad's language. And, um, you know, she became very politically astute and involved in the 1950s and 60s here in Brisbane when um, there was nothing for our people. People were moving off from the missions um, and particularly Sherberg, where my mum's family comes from, the Holtz. And um, they came in search of uh, education, housing, employment um, and, and help course health services so um she helped um really facilitate that and organize that and i i I never felt that women of her generation had been given you know the the absolute recognition Mm -hmm. that they should have and hence that's why i wrote um the book too and for those of you who haven't had the the opportunity to read that Auntie Rita has been republished, I understand. Yes. You can order that tonight when you ring up and you order Sister Girl as well. And I think we can blame you and Auntie Rita for the fact that many, many, many daughters around the country were like, "Why Jackie wrote Auntie Rita's story. Why can't we have Auntie, Auntie Elsie's story? And what people might not realise is back then, I think your your work with your mother was the first book of its kind that was in dual voices so there's both your voice and your mother's voice so that was and so we won't go into that because i know that, you know that you can imagine mother daughter trying to work together on a project um as wonderful as you both were mm-hmm. and are now we're talking about what we talk about family I wanted to give a quick shout out to your beautiful sister, Nairi, as well. She's your number one right-hand woman and the truest sister girl in every sense. You do dedicate this edition of Sister Girl to both your mum and Nairi. Um, I've known you both for many years. We've had lots of good times here in New York. Um, and I wrote about you both as the, as, the, as the two Murray women walking around the gap of an afternoon in titters because um, you inspired myself, you ins- you continue to inspire myself and my characters. So hello to Nairi out there tonight. You know, part- we're doing these shout outs, but part of this is also about acknowledging our sister girls. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. So Estelle, Nairi, your mum. Now I want to get straight into one of my favourite pieces of uh, Sister Girl and it's the chapter titled Are All the Women White? And it's a transcript of the radio conversation between, and I quote, two black revolutionary women, namely you and your role model, African-American writer, Belle Hooks, in which you discuss, we both discuss the differences and the similarities um, of the experience of feminism in both countries and its influence and the uh, relevance, I should think, the relevance between uh, for black women. Now, that interview was taped in 1996. I know that that exchange was really significant for you. Um, so I'd like if you talk a little bit about that conversation and, and how relevant you think that exchange is today in 2022. Yes, well, um, back in those days, there were, there were no Aboriginal women writing this stuff. Absolutely nothing in terms of... Uh, you know, feminism or um, gender issues, really. And uh, I was very lucky. Uh, my friend Nicola Joseph uh, from the Coming Out show in the ABC in Sydney, um, uh, Nicola and I would have these discussions. And, uh, you know, she, she is a woman uh, from um, an ethnic background. And uh, that's when I started having great conversations with old women and women who were 
experiencing some of the same things, you know, we were being denied, shut out of things and, uh, uh, and put down largely. But getting back to, um, uh, back to uh, Bell Hooks, so there were no women writing this stuff and I wanted the voice. I wanted to hear what other uh, black women in, in the world were saying. Quickly, I read some of her stuff and uh, women like Audrey Lord, Alice Walker, and I thought, wow, this is, this is fantastic. I really need to um, uh, try to get some of that discussion, some of that dialogue into, um, into the minds, I guess, in the hearts of Aboriginal women here because mm. we're all feeling it, mm. absolutely all feeling it. So uh, luckily, um, Nicola hooked us up and uh, we were able to have that wonderful discussion. Um, and I actually did meet uh, Bell Hooks uh, 25 years ago mm. when uh, John Henry and I were actually over in, um, uh, in Europe on one of those writing tours, mm. which was lovely. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was great to have met her and uh, I really uh, got a lot from her writings and um, just the joy, you know, when you hear that tape and it was played back, mm the joy that we both had being two women of colour exchanging these very old and, and, and very dear ideas uh, for both of us. And, and finding finally finding that connection and the relevance. And, of course, just a couple of years later, we had Aileen Morton Robinson's talking up to the white woman that finally came out. And, you know, we, we're talking about invisible whiteness and things like that. It's, when you mentioned John Henry then, sorry, John Henry, but it reminds me when you were about 11 and we were doing something together and we, we had to just stop somewhere on the way home and grab some sushi for this 11-year-old sport boy. Sorry about that. This came to mind. Anywho, so now, and, and that, that piece, though, is one of my favourite pieces and, um, and I know that it still remains important to you. Now, this edition, as as reflected in the, uh, in the title, is, has reflections on identity and reconciliation and uh, Judaism. Now, in the chapter titled The Gift of Identity, you write that Aboriginal identity is both the personal and the political, which we know, how identity has been framed by government policy. And I think there's like 60 different pieces of legislation over time related to de defining us in policy, uh, how it's formed by social processes, um, that the essence of identity is very uh, complex and multi-layered, they're, they're your words. Um, you also say, though, that it's our internal kinship system and our land that are fundamental to our actual identities as Aboriginal people. Now, in that essay, what I'm interested about, so it's sort of like a blast from the past when I'm reading your words because that was published in ATSIC News in 2001, so 21 years ago. And my question to you tonight is, do you think in 2022 we still need to be defining and breaking down Aboriginality for non-Indigenous Australians? And if so, why? I think that's a, a yes and a no answer from me. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, because I think we have to still keep reminding them that we are here, that we are actually in our country, we are the first peoples of this land, and that um, that needs to be respected and that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I know that sometimes you can go to places and people, you know, kind of will look up at you like you're a creature from outer space or something if you say, if they ask you what nationality are you, and you say, I'm Aboriginal. Do you still get that? Oh, yes, I do, actually. Just last... Um, Last uh, week when I went into uh, a bakery over at um, uh, Fernie Hills and a uh, lovely lady she was, um, as it turned out, she came up and she says to me now, uh, ask the same questions. And I said, yes. And uh, she said, oh, that's great. And I get that, you know, I, I get people more acknowledging that these mm -hmm. days, you know, saying, that's fantastic. And she said, well, I'm wearing an Aboriginal print, as you can see, she said, you yes, know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I said, I know your face from somewhere. I said, are you involved in reconciliation? And mm. She said, yes, I've been down to Terrell Park. Oh. Hello, Flo Watson. Um, 
out there uh, and uh, she she was part of the group there. So, you know, it's, um, it's amazing. But I think we just got to keep reminding people that we're still here. Um, why I say no, it's because that um, um, sometimes we've just said enough, you know, we're just tired, we're just over it in terms of um, uh, putting forward our, our, our rights to social justice and, um, and other issues. And, uh, you know, I, I just, um, I think there's, a, a, there, there's something in, in my book that says, well, you know, I'm going to hand the pen over to um, younger um, black writers now. But, you know, I'll, I'll sort of a few more books left in yes. me, I think, and it, just yeah. like you, not as no, prolific. No, but, but <laughs> I, think, I, think in, I think in the introduction to this, you talk about, you know, the next generation, you, you pay tribute to, uh, you know, what the work's, work that's been done and what needs to be done and that you're there to mentor and help where you yeah. can, but it's time for the young people to... The young people that used to be us. Yes, yeah, it still just, is. Yeah, Anything under sixty for me, darling. Step up. Okay, great. Well, but I'm there. Um, now the new edition. So obviously, this is completely biased, and I've pulled out all the things that spoke to me, and um, and you can all talk about the things that speak to you in your book clubs. But the new edition to me, there's there's a um, uh, there's lots of speeches. There's speeches and the previously published essays and so forth. Now. In here is a farewell speech that you gave um, about when you're leaving the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, otherwise known as CAR, for the younger peoples. Uh, you did, delivered it in 2007, and, of course, it coincided with the anniversary of the 1967 referendum, of which you and I were part of a panel of, I think, nine people at the Sydney Writers Festival with Aidan Ridgway talking about the anniversary back then as well. Yeah. Now, there's one paragraph I wanted to read out, which I loved, and it says, I remember the day of the 1967 referendum well and see it still in many ways through the eyes of the 11-year-old girl that I was at the time. And I also remember some of the long lead up to it. If I was asked to make one more toffee or lamington for a fundraising drive or do the hula, which I thought was interesting, or stand on another street corner and hand out badges, dot, dot, dot. I really love that paragraph. So you really remember all those things? Oh, I totally remember them. They were in the days of Opal, which was the one people of Australia yes, meet, yes. of which Neville Bonner yes. um, and Mira Langford and others, my mum, uh, founded here uh, in Brisbane. And um, they were magical days because that to me, you know, I mean, I was, I was 11 years of age and even younger, even younger when my mother became very involved in political movements, although she always said she didn't believe she was a political person. Well, oh. she was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, that, and, and I see when I go to conferences or, or, you know, meetings or something, and I see our women mm -hmm. um, bringing their little kids or, you know, nieces and nephews or the little ones come along and they sit there and uh, I can just see that they're filling up these kids with uh, knowledge and pride. I mean, you know, I did that with John Henry of course, mm. and, um, you know, and other, other, all my friends have done that with their, with their children and, um, you know, their, their, their uh, little ones and their family, nieces mm. and nephews. And it does, it just sticks with you. It sticks with your DNA. I mean, you may follow a different path. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I didn't. I kind of stuck with that um, very deep feeling of uh, social justice in my veins. So, hence, you know, great role model for me and, um, yeah, a real inspiration. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back to women and leadership and, and inspiration, but you did remind me in 1993 we had in Brisbane the Indigenous or a Black Women's Writers Conference. I mean, really, Tony Janke tried to teach us to sing a song she said there's only like five percent of the world are off key and I, they're all in that room I'm sure me included but Kathy Craigie another an amazing mm, yes. woman that's done so much in the arts in particular mm. she Mia was there mm. you know so there were women there with their children and, and Mia's you know grown into an extraordinary woman as well now in this particular back to the speech that was at that night yes in this speech you write that you were schooled by the early reconciliationists in this country you suggest you had reconciliation in your genes. 
Now, reading your memories of CAR is, is really interesting and wonderful because we I, at the time I only got interested in reconciliation because you dragged me to a meeting with 400 women in West End one night back in 96. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested in knowing, though, that's that's not that I didn't get fully from that from your piece is that that speech was given at the Sydney Institute. The head of the Sydney Institute at the time was Jared Henderson. Now, you say that in some ways you felt that your life had been building up to that moment for 40 years. So that's a pretty extraordinary um, statement. I'm like, can you remember that night? And what was it like giving that, giving that speech in that space to that audience? Yeah, well, it was, um, it was quite surreal, I guess, in the sense that... Um, um, I had um, toyed with the idea about writing uh, this speech which would culminate in a whole range of uh, thoughts, ideas and experiences that I had um, over that time and particularly being involved in, uh, in reconciliation. And uh, that night I knew I was, um, I was leaving uh, the formal process anyway of um, of being the co-chair of Reconciliation Australia and before that, six years on the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. Who was the co-chair with you? Uh, Fred Cheney. Fred Cheney. That's what, yes, uh, the lovely Fred Cheney. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fred and I, um, um, the whole committee did a whole great lot of work together. And, uh, you know, I'm pleased to see it still continues. News, Reconciliation Australia today and um, you know they've, uh, they've chopped and changed on a few things but nevertheless you know I think people really do want to see that in our country they do want to see some kind of um, uh, resolve and um, rec recognition now you know and I think certainly Anita I can say this mm -hmm. that the um, say whatever you want it's your the, launch the um, you know the reconciliation process has uh, warmed up a lot of things in our country um, uh, here in Queensland I believe it's around the treaty process mm -hmm. which can you uh, speak a little bit years, about the treaty process yes well I've uh, been involved uh, for the last uh, uh, two and a half years in and out of COVID um, and uh, we've had consultations and uh, you know first time ever that we would have a treaty in our in our country uh, sorry in our state state here of Queensland and um, um, I've got to give a shout out to Jackie Trad who was our absolute champion and uh, Leanne Enoch and the other uh, Indigenous politicians that have really supported us um, uh, we've got a huge investment from uh, the government in the last budget and uh, we're, we're just waiting on, you know, of course, some of the COVID stuff to, uh, to subside and, and hopefully get back into it. So that's, um, I, I think for me, that's kind of uh, the bookends of my career. Um, so that chapter will be in the next edition. It certainly will. And if people wanted to learn more about that process now, where would they go? Oh, they can go to the, um, uh, well, it's the DATSIP uh, .gov.au uh, website of which uh, all papers and the reports are on there mm -hmm. and um, you know we have the ability now though to uh, start something that is independent that has been totally resourced and you know as I say it's just been a wonderful uh, uh, recognition of, of the work that um, that needs to be done but you know something that uh, we've searched for so long in terms of, you know, healing the wounds of the past here. Now, we could talk about that all night, but <laughs> so many other things I want to ask you. There's a chapter, a really important, well, they're all important, but there's another important chapter on Indigenous women and leadership. And you write of the challenges, uh, as you know, them facing Aboriginal women in roles of leadership. Now, there's three particular ones that I'd like you to speak to. The first one is the tall poppy syndrome in our communities. That's one of the challenges. Can you speak to that for a minute? Yes, certainly. Uh, well, there is a tall poppy. I think anyone who puts themselves out there in the public space, whether it's as, as a speaker or a, a, as a, a writer or an artist, um, obviously, um, I believe that, you know, and it's a fair enough thing, you're going to um, be offered 
criticism uh, and some uh, some guidance sometimes. Um, but for our mob, you know, well, I was brought up with this, Anita, I'm not sure about you, but I was told never to big note myself in front of people. Yeah, yeah. Be humble. Be humble. You don't do that. Um, yes, missus. Yeah. No, missus. You know, all that stuff. And um, so we take it from there that, um, you know, we, we kind of uh, assume a, a kind of a humbleness about us and, I must say, you know, I've been told that many times. Oh, the uh, humility is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, out there, there is a tall poppy. And look, I've been taken down a couple of times too mm -hmm. um, so, by people. So let's talk about what are the strategies for dealing with that? So I was always taught, my mother taught me to be dignified in the face of adversity. Mm -hmm. So her and I can have barneys about issues but there's no way, you know, it's, we all do, we all speak to the issues and the challenges in our communities uh, publicly in different ways. So how do, um, so how does someone like you, who, who is very humble, your work speaks for itself, you just get out there and do the job, right? But you've just said, you know, you've been, you've been, um, you know, pulled down a couple of times. How do you, for the young ones out there, what are the tips on dealing with that? Well, you know, uh, one of the most beautiful quotes I've ever heard in my life is by Michelle Obama, who says, when they take the low road, you take the high. Mm -hmm. And that's always stuck in my mind when, um, you know, when there's some very uh, undue and unfair criticism. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, we keep that in mind. But, you know, I think there's a right to, to mm -hmm. offer some criticism as long as it's, you know, it's kind of a kind criticism. It's I know that delivery. sounds a bit weird. Yeah, no, it's about delivery. It's about I think delivery. the old people yeah. talk about social media and so forth and you see the piling on of our own women on other women in particular. Yeah. And I think I always think about my orders down in, on country and I think, you know, that's who I worry about. If I get a phone call saying we want to see you, then I pack. Right. Yeah. Um, and the their way of doing things is you'll be told well and truly top once and then that's it. Mm -hmm. And um, the same with my mother uh, as well. And so I just wondered then, so we, we had that tall poppy syndrome in our mm -hmm. own communities. We're not different to other communities. Other communities have that as well. But yeah. Now there's two other ones, the challenges facing women, in our women in particular in leadership, um, sexism. Oh, yes. Let's speak to that. Sexism. Well, sexism um, is one of those things always constantly on uh, the mind of any Aboriginal uh, woman who I, I think purports to want to do a, a leadership role. Um, I, and I've got to say, Anita, I really don't feel um, uh, it, it was it, it's as, as bad now than it was in my day. Maybe because I was younger. Okay. Maybe because I was younger and I didn't have the words or, or the you know the um, the confidence to stand up to it. But usually, you know, I said um, very little in fact. But now, you know, um, with the, the power that uh, you gradually grow into and the wisdom, I think uh, that um, uh, the sexism, um, well, for me, certainly as I've got older, um, has really uh, abated in that sense. So there's a couple of things, in, and that's good to hear, mm. that, you, that but I think when we look at the misogyny that we're seeing every day in the news, particularly from within the government and so forth, that there will be many people saying that things haven't changed, but also it's more public, which is good people are being outed for the behaviour. Now, when we take that misogyny and that sexism and we couple it with racism, we've got a double whammy. And we know that you write and we know most of us tuning in will know that Indigenous women in, in roles of leadership are dealing with both. Mm. So what are your, the, these are the challenges, what are your tips for dealing with, with that from yeah. your own experience? Yeah, and they're simultaneous suppressions because sometimes you don't know what's, what's hitting on you, whether it's the racism or the sexism yeah. or whether it is both, yeah. you right. know, and how you tease that out. Um, but, yeah, racism, I've always felt personally, it has been our greatest um, enemy in terms of our lives here. You know, I can deal I can deal to a certain extent with the sexism. The racism is so endemic and pervasive. I mean, it 
it, it cuts through everything, you know, um, women in prison, mm. it cuts through um, education, health, housing, you know, yeah. all those things. And uh, every day, you know, I used to say there wasn't a day when I was younger that I would wake up not feeling defensive mm. about what this day might bring for me in terms of uh, being uh, a black woman uh, because, you know, I'd look in the mirror and I would see this black face first before I saw a woman or anything else. And, you know, um, I don't know whether I have mellowed. Or it's for me, I, I just um, have learned to deal with it in a better way, mm. that uh, it doesn't hurt me as much as it hurts me when, when I was younger and, and growing up. I mean, it hurts me if I see, you know, our younger people uh, being um, getting racist attacks mm -hmm. on them. And it but still happens. It we still hear happens. the stories every, every, day. Day. every day. Every day. I do work yes. in schools and mm. kids will tell me about cameras and staff following them around shops and so forth. So in some ways, none of that has changed. Yeah. Um, just listening to you now, you reminded me of when I was younger in 96 and Dale Spender, who you would know, she wanted to nominate me to be on a board. And I said, I don't want to be sitting there having to respond to every single racist comment that may be made or may not be made. And she said, and in the way I see it, if I'm in a room and a man says something sexist, it's up to another man to pull that person up. So if you're there, and I was, like, I was going to be the first black fellow to do it, if you're there, thank you, um, and if something happens, it's up to the non-Indigenous people in the room. And so that gave me, at least I knew there was one person at that table who thought like that. I think that's how I've always felt. I thought, you know, what if that happens? You know, we're always looking around waiting for, like, why do we have to be the ones that jump up yes. to it to respond to a, a, something that's said that's racist or sexist mm. in the room? So. Yes, but at the same time, and even you know, it's a big defence mechanism for us, and we get our bully up. Yes, yeah, straight up. Straight up. <laughs> and we want to, to go for them straight and away. defend. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's the way, certainly, um, yeah. you know, I was brought up, yeah. is never back away from yeah. that. You know, if you see racism, you, you take it head on. So... Always, my father would drive me to every march. He would say, "Just don't get arrested," and I'd say, "Have your checkbook ready, um, and you know, stand up for what you believe in." Yeah. Now, in that same chapter, I want to do something with the audience side because in that same chapter, you mentioned, you know, throughout the book, you mentioned different role models and mentors in your life, but in this chapter, you mentioned Evelyn Scott. There are all these beautiful women who have uh, passed up: Evelyn Scott, May O'Brien, and of course Doris Pilkington, who was also one of my uh, role models. Uh, I thought what we might do is we might create a list in the chat box tonight of people to put in, you know, one or two of your mentors or your Indigenous women around Australia or First Nations women around the world who you see as role models. And if someone could put in there for me, please, um, uh, Annie Ruby Langford Guinevere and, and Kerry Reed Gilbert, they were an, in, an, our good friends yeah. and they were enormous uh, role models for me. And maybe Fiona can publish that in her next newsletter. Sorry, Fiona, I didn't run that by you, but that was a thought. Now, that's a nice segue talking about women and, and your role models to mm. sisterhood and titterism. Mm. Now, you write in this fabulous book, have you rung up and ordered it yet? Um, but you love the way that Alice Walker coined the term womanism for African-American women and women of colour. Can you just tell us a little bit about the impact that, that the coining of that phrase on you? Yes, well, when I, I read that piece, I thought, oh, she's explaining it like I'm seeing it here in our own country. Like there was never a place for black men. There was never a, a place where they could say what their struggles were too yeah. in terms of the patriarchy and the matriarchy. Mm -hmm that exists in our country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I've always believed that Aboriginal women have uh, always maintained that degree of personal prestige, autonomy, and, um, you know, ability to do things. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, when um, white people came to this country, white men, they uh, had a go and just tried to annihilate our black men, didn't listen to them and, uh, you know, Hence, you know, the rest is history. So I've always known that there was, you know, a place for um, black men that I love 
the ones in my family, Jaro Voice in particular, beautiful son, and, and others um, that I know that are on the um, uh, online feed tonight. Thank you very, very much for joining us that have always supported me as, um, as a black male. So that was a, a, a big gap, whereas, you know, white feminism didn't explore that stuff. They said, oh, no. And, you know, that old adage about you've got to be part of the uh, solution if, if you're not part of the problem, problem yeah, something like that. Of, yeah, you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Yeah. It particularly applies to di domestic and family violence, you see. Yeah. And when I used to speak many years ago as the only uh, Indigenous woman at these conferences, I would actually get held down. I'd get held down and uh, they would say, no, we're not talking about them, we're mm. talking about women, you know. I said, well, hang on, they're part of us, you know, they're the, they're, they're the people I love um, and we all should love. But anyway, that's changed now. There is a kind of a, a, a much more inclusiveness about, you know, uh, what, what that's to be. But also, you know, for, for Alice Walker, it didn't, um, you know, the, the recognition of black women wasn't recognised by, by white women. It was always you know, my way or the highway, you know, um, we just we can't we can't think about that. Now, having said that, I've got to be fair. I've got to be really fair to say that um, there have been pockets of really terrific um, white women in my life and um, and um, and called women as well. And a lot of them are on the feed tonight as well. And we're here at Avid Reader with yes. the matriarch of book selling in Brisbane with <laughs> Fiona Stager, who's very supportive of all our books. Well, so, she yeah. is. You know, so we yeah. can't kind of deny yeah. they're not yeah. blacks either, but at the same time. Yeah. But I found these people have always dealt with their racism or they've, you know, that they've really got great um, social justice. They're aware. Awareness. awareness. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're really aware. So, um, but the, the, the womanism... Thing, I thought that's a fantastic term. I'd love to find a term. And you said titter, you know, titter means sister. And we're glad, which is a great segue into let I need you to talk before we finish about titterism because that will be a word that is not in everybody's vocab no. tonight. No. It's in our vocab, but it's not mm. in everyone. So for people down the line, what um what is titter, what does it mean? And what does it look like in a practical sense to you? Mm. Well, titterism is like womanism. I think it's our term that really is not about white women feminism, you know. And um, and even now, I kind of, I would love people to use that term a lot more. You know, there's still those saying, Jackie Huggins, well, she's a black feminist, or Jackie Huggins um, around, you know, um, some feminism. Oh, I'd love to. Come on, language is important. Yeah. I'd like to switch that. Okay, we need that to be in next year's, uh, the, you know, the word list for the Macquarie Dictionary. We need titterism. So can we get that trending, please, on Twitter tonight? Hashtag titterism. Um, now, this is going to be controversial for some people. Not so much me because I kind of got it. What's with the chapter heading, don't call me auntie? <gasps> oh, that one. Shout out to Nancy for this. Um, who I know is listening. Um, look, since I turned 50, as I say, there was this kind of, uh, everyone felt they had the right to call me auntie. And, you know, my beautiful grey hair now um, and, uh, you know, my uh, age and in, in, in stature. And I thought, oh, wow, why is everybody calling me auntie if you are not king, family, community or mob? Or, or you're in the workplace or you're in the, you know, you're yes. into a government office and someone's calling you oh, auntie Jack and you're saying, what? How no, about that? But I never know you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that is the worst thing, mm -hmm. Anita, that I found and mm -hmm. certainly with my work with Treaty and, you know, by G. I know I've, I've pulled up a few people, public servants, who've done that to me. And I could be sitting around the table, and the only one gets called auntie, and all the black men mm. are being uh, are being called by their first names. Or by their positions. By so their doctor, positions. So you should be yes. Dr Jackie Huggins. Yes. Yeah. So um, I thought, well, I'm going to write this. And women were talking to me. So many women said, oh, I hate the way they call us auntie, you know, we're going to change that and I said one day I am going to write an essay 
for all of us. Uh, that was 15 years later when I wrote that essay. And let me tell well, it you. It takes a lot of drafts. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it actually, that is the most uh, popular, I guess, mm. uh, essay that people have come back and wanted to have a discussion with me about. Or they say, oh, I finally get it. You know what? I've got to ask permission or I'll have to ask you, what is your noun? Mm. Do you wish me to call you auntie or is it something else? Would you like Dr. Jackie, Dr. Huggins, uh, et cetera? And I usually say if it's in a professional sense, of course, and people I work with, I prefer the latter. But, of course, I'm never going to deny my family not to call me auntie. Sure. So um, I, I wrote it. I think it's a clever little piece. I'm very proud of that piece. In, in it's fact. right at the end. Yes, it's, it's right, the at the belly, end. right at the end. So I, I've said to women now, um, so when they call you auntie next and, and you object, refer them to page 212 of Sister Girl. But, but now, uh, Anita, let's remember though, there's a lot of our women that love being called oh, yeah. auntie. Can I say, I love they going, love it. I love the little ears, I love going to schools and yeah. the kids. But the teachers will say to me, what would you like the students to call you? And I'll say, well, they can call me Auntie Anita or Bumali Anita or uh, high means hot, so they can call me Dr Hot, one of the two. <laughs> but I think, I mean, and it's good. We were all raised to call uh, people who are as children older than, um, you know, you know, whether it's neighbours, auntie, uncle and so forth. But I remember um, now, here we go, Auntie Patsy Cameron down in Tassie because we were sister girls and then all of a sudden she was elder status and I remember we co I launched her book and she launched my book at the same event and I had to say to her what would you like me to refer to you as because I've always we've always just been yes. titters right yes. Yes. um and so that's that's always an I mean you just have the conversation that's yes. respectful conscious of the time yes. now before um we're going to finish but you've already referenced the, the Jarrah men and I wanted to just acknowledge them also because I know you you adore those men in your life um, and we and I always want to acknowledge myself those men that uh, are there and propping us up all the time. Yes. Uh, there's all you've always had the men, those men, those Jeremy men supporting you, um, as you mentioned, standing by you during the struggle. But of course, there was your dad, and now he, he did pass away when you were only two, which is a tragedy. But you've done something extraordinary, and you've written his story, which is coming out through Magnavala Books in April. You can order your copy tonight also through Avid Reader, pre-order it. Can you tell us a little bit about your dad? And I love this title, Jack of Hearts QX11594. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, Anita, well, I'm actually, uh, I've written that with Nairi. Um, Nairi Jaro is my co-author. And uh, we, um, uh, we had this idea for many years to write that. And, you know, I thought I was a very brave woman writing a biography about my mother. Well, now it's father's book. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, as you say, we lost him when we were very young and uh, I didn't have him like the physical presence of mother uh, with us or, or her words. So we did a lot of archival um, and, uh, you know, history, um, uh, war, war history research and stuff. So um, uh, it was a, it's, it's been a pleasure to write that and I did... Um, I did promise Magabala my next book, which was nice. And um, but you know, thank you UQP as well for uh, uh, for doing um, Sister Girl with me too. But I'm very proud that um, uh, particularly Madonna and Jean, I have to give you a shout out to. Uh, but look, I, I, I'm very uh, very proud of this book particularly. I think it's um, you know. I've often said if I never write another book again, this this is this is fine by me, but I'll be writing more books, of course. Yeah. So um, this is a, a, a great um, a, a, a great uh, tribute to him, but also to all those that there were fifty Indigenous men uh, who were sent uh, to the Burma Death Railway, uh, and uh, some of them came back, some of them didn't. Luckily, he did for us. But the three healthy children of which um, I don't know how he did it. But, um, yeah, but I'm very proud of this book. So. And the QX11594 was his yes. number? That was his service number. Service and number. his name was Jack Huggins. And as Nari and I wrote the book, you know, the um, actually it wasn't until we got to the final end of it that we realised 
that's a great title to call it Jack of Hearts because he was our heart, you know. Yeah, so um, please enjoy and um, hopefully we'll be back here at Over to, to do I, something I else. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Now, before we sign off, what I thought we would finish is with a, with a quote that you chose, Jackie, um, your final words to leave with our beautiful audience who have um, joined us this evening. So this is on page 57. Okay, and thank you all for joining us. Throughout my life, my driving force has always been my Aboriginality in whatever I do. I am nurtured and guided by it. My foremost identity is as an Aboriginal person. My family gave me a strong and proud upbringing and a belief that to be Aboriginal was the greatest honour in the world. We just had to educate other people into believing this was true. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Please um, uh, get a hold of. If you can't buy it, please ask your local library to order it in. Do put it on your book club reading list um, and do, do do a review on Goodreads if you can because that really matters to authors as well. So share it on your social media, uh, all platforms. And if you've got a racist uncle or auntie in your family, this is the perfect gift for them. So lots of love from us. Lots of love. What a morning. Congratulations, Jackie. Thanks, Elizabeth.